our state's calorie nuclear power reactors. <clears throat> but now, incredibly enough, our governor and both of our U.S. senators are working hard to try to, that's a good idea. I, I think that the, the hoarseness is age, but thank you, Paul. Um, I'll drink some and see. Now I'm not horse. Um, let's see, Caroline. <clears throat> but now, incredibly enough, our governor and both of our U.S. senators, one of whom defeated Todd Aiken, uh, are working hard to try to win some of the U.S. Department of Energy funding to build, manufacture, and export the so-called small modular reactors on, on land next to the Callaway plant. As I said at the start of these comments, the Mallinckrodt chemists in St. Louis had been contracted in April 1942 to try to figure out how to purify the tons of uranium needed to make a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction and then atom bombs. After only 50 days in total secrecy, the Mallinckrodt scientists were successful and then on December 2nd, 1974, 70 years ago tomorrow, the world entered into the atomic age. Great human tragedies occurred in Japan, World War II ended, and irreversible nuclear assaults have continued ever since on our planet's air, water, land, and living creatures. In 1976, a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers hearing was held in Missouri about a proposed permit for the Callaway nuclear plant that was to be built about uh, five miles um, from the Missouri River. Ninety members of the public spoke to protest the fact that the plant would release radioactive gases, liquids, and particles into the air and into the Missouri River as a routine part of the Callaway plant's operation, that it would not take an accident. There are some brand new Beyond Nuclear pamphlets here today describing these routine releases. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission diagram that we used on the cover of the pamphlet was originally titled Exposure Pathways to Man, and that's the, that's the drawing that we used. But starting in the early 1980s, the NRC changed the title to read Potentially Meaningful Exposure Pathways to Man. They didn't just say these are exposure. It's, it's a wonderful graphic. And it shows fish and cows and crops. The newer NRC diagram also describes as the gaseous effluent as, quote, diluted by dispersion. They just had, and the one you have in the yellow pamphlet, it says gaseous effluent from a nuclear power plant. But then they added in 1980 or 82, diluted by dispersion. And it just, this, the new, uh, the new uh, drawing also shows the liquid effluent as, quotes, diluted by mixing in liquid streams. I've written a lot of pamphlets and other descriptive material about nuclear power plants for almost 40 years now. And I like very much to give copies to people of what I've written. In fact, I've offered to give a quarter to anyone who can read through one of my papers without falling asleep. And in all these years of offering my bribe, I've only had to give out five quarters. They're not really exciting. And that's as far as I, I finished writing this this morning, at, starting at 4 o'clock, and I have lots of things I can read to fill up my time. Otherwise, there's some people in the audience I've asked to come and help me out if I run out of help. This is going to take a while. Um, this is um, a wonderful quote also by Dr. Hannes Alfen, who, as I said, is a, was a Nobel laureate in physics. And this was in the May 1972 Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. And maybe you all have heard this before, I just think it's very good. Fission energy is safe only if a number of critical devices work as they should, if a number of people in key positions follow all their instructions. If there is no sabotage, no hijacking of the transports, if no reactor fuel processing plant or reprocessing plant 
or repository anywhere in the world is situated in a, re in a region of riots or guerrilla activity, and no revolution or war, even a conventional one, takes place in those regions, the enormous quantities of extremely dangerous material must not get into the hands of ignorant people or desperados. No acts of God can be permitted." End quote. And yeah, it's, it's very powerful. Um, and then I have a quote from Dr. John Goffman, whom I adored. Um, this is a recommendation for a moratorium on the construction and licensing of any new nuclear power plants. So he's calling for a moratorium. Breeder and non-breeder, plus a termination of licensing of all nuclear power plants now in operation. Obviously, those environmentalists who have worked toward making nuclear power, quotes, safe, may at first consider this extreme, that is, calling for a moratorium. Quite the contrary, I would suggest the continued operation of existing plants and the licensing of any new ones represents reckless extremism coupled with an abdication of man's moral obligations to this and future generations. I know of no valid evidence to suggest that nuclear fission power can be made acceptable or that we shall ever need nuclear fission as an energy source. And the essence of the problem at hand is moral, not technical. The best way to stay healthy? Exercise your voice. At the New Mercy Health, we believe that carefully listening to you and encouraging you to take an active role in your own health care is an important part of keeping you healthy. So you'll find our extensive network of physicians not only use the latest technology, they focus on what you have to say. Your voice, our expertise. Mercy Health. Fresh and Tasty Deli, located inside the Henry Street Health Hut, offers a variety of options for every diet. Organic, raw, vegan, vegetarian, gluten, or grain-free. You can sample specialty sandwiches, or you can build your own wrapper salad by choosing from a wide selection of fresh meats, cheeses, veggies, and dressings. From gourmet soups to smoothies, shakes, juices, herbal teas and coffee, to mouth-watering desserts, the Fresh and Tasty Deli is here to serve you. City Glass & Mirror features glass for every purpose, servicing both residential and commercial. Their full-service showroom displays every aspect of what City Glass has to offer. Handrails, closet systems, replacement windows, bath hardware, shower doors, and custom mirrors. They even offer auto glass and storefronts to see all they have to offer. City Glass & Mirror, located at 100 West 7th Street in Grand Haven and 631 Commerce Court, Suite 10 in Holland. Buckwhite Schultz & Associates Incorporated, investment products and services. For more information, call 799-9889 or 866-799-9889. Kansas, who was fighting the proposed Wolf Creek plant 
near his farm. He told me, which is the twin of our caliber reactor, he told me there would be a vent in the reactor building and that radioactive gases would be released to the atmosphere through the vent. I had known that the walls, roof, and foundation of the reactor building were to be built of thick concrete reinforced with steel bars and assumed that they were designed to completely seal the radioactivity inside. However, I found out the farmer was right. The reactor building does have a vent, and we have a picture of that on the back page of our new yellow pamphlet uh, showing the vent at my reactor. I had often read that a core meltdown plus a break in the reactor containment building would let radioactive gas into the atmosphere. What I had not known until I talked to the Kansas farmer is that the building comes with a break in it, that is, a vent for the release of gases, including radioactive gases. In fact, nuclear power plants cannot operate without regular, deliberate releases of radioactive water and gases. The releases from the reactor building are needed to control the pressure, temperature, and humidity and to keep radioactivity from exceeding government limits for workers. Think of water boiling in a kettle. The escape of steam relieves pressure inside. A nuclear power plant operates in much the same way. Hot radioactive gases inside the reactor building must be vented into the atmosphere. This is done through the vents that are built into the building. The vents have filters that stop some of the radioactive gases from being released. However, no filtering technology exists for some of the gases like xenon-135, which decays into cesium-135, an isotope with a two million year half-life. And they also cannot filter my favorite isotope, which is tritium. <laughs> oh, why is tritium my favorite isotope? Well, tritium is radioactive hydrogen, and it's created in the reactor. And there is no way to filter it. And when I first heard about tritium, and I noticed that the Callaway Environmental Impact Statement estimated that 310 curies per year of tritium would be released into the Missouri River upstream from where St. Louis gets its drinking water. And so, and the other isotopes that they listed, like various radioactive iodines and so forth, were just tiny fractions of a curie per year. But Callaway, they said, 310 curies. And later changed that to something like 420. They don't have any idea. And so I called a health physicist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and I said, could you please tell me about tritium, radioactive hydrogen? And he said, tritium is no big deal. All it can do is destroy a DNA molecule. <laughs> I said, you know, I really don't want my DNA molecules destroyed or my children's or my husband's and so forth. But it cannot be filtered and it really cannot be monitored and it does leach through the fuel rod cladding and a lot of it builds up and they do release it. They, they shim bleed some of the water in the reactor vessel every day. And so, pardon me? 12.3 uh, years, so it's around for 120 years at least. 12.3 years. Oh, did you say half-life? What did someone? Yeah, it's 12.3 years, and you have to multiply the half-life by at least 10 to find out how long it will be in the environment. And you know, as he said, all it will do is destroy a DNA molecule. I think it does more than that. But we also have, you know, the noble gases that cannot. There's no economically feasible way to filter the tritium that's released into the environment. There's also no way to monitor how much is released. And it goes not only into the river, lake, or ocean that provides the cooling water, but it goes into the atmosphere as well. And as does radioactive krypton um, that becomes rubidium and then strontium, which we had a baby tooth survey in St. Louis that showed that fallout from nuclear weapons testing was getting into our children's teeth, or the baby teeth, and that was a very effective way of stopping atmospheric bomb testing, that, those studies. Um, so they can filter out noble gases, um, which I learned they call them noble, so because they're like the nobility, they don't mingle with the oil. <laughs> that was, yeah. Actually, can I talk about crud? 
it. That was my first technical word that I learned. And I wanted, I wanted a, a license plate that said crud, and I said, like, we had two cars at the time. My husband and I thought could have grunge, because in the secondary coolant loop, they call it the green grunge, and in the primary coolant loop, they call it crud, which stood for Chalk River Unidentified Deposits, which they found a very, very hot piece of crud or radioactive metal on the floor of the Chalk River Canada plant when they were cleaning up after an accident. And um, so at any rate, they, this is a part of becoming 79, is I have no idea what the beginning of my steps. Does anyone know that? Paul? Fraud <laughs> and Cobalt 60. Okay, it's Cobalt 60. Cobalt 60, um, okay. Strontium 90 becomes rubidium 90, and then it becomes. No, I'm sorry. Krypton 90 becomes, no, Krypton becomes, Krypton becomes rubidium and then um, strontium. And the noble gas xenon becomes cesium. And, and I think, I don't know if Bob Alvarez is here, but I've often wondered if, if the reason there's so much cesium found where there is, where there are fuel rods, irradiated fuel rods stored or where they're leaking and so forth. I wonder if some of the cesium comes as a daughter product of the xenon that gets out of the fuel rods they, and, and, and into the environment they can't filter it. So, does anyone else have a question or is it time for me to sit down? I not, I not only have this voice, but I can't see anything. Ma'am, did you say you were from Tacoma Park, by the way? Beyond Nuclear, I'm on the board of Beyond Nuclear, which is located in Tacoma yeah, Park. Yeah, I lived I'm from Tacoma. St. Louis. Yeah, I lived in Tacoma Park for years. My name is Patricia Axelrod, and I conduct the Desert Storm Think Tank and All Veterans Advocate, which is a project uh, under the 501c3 umbrella of Alliance for Global Justice, seeded by a grant from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Enough. Uh, I wondered if you could discuss the evolution and the deployment of tritium weaponry as well as the advent of uh, the processing of nuclear waste into radioactive weaponry, commonly referred to as depleted uranium. And I wonder if you have any expertise in that or care to grapple it? I don't know about nuclear weapons, about, you know, tritium. Weapons, but I do know that reprocessing is really bad, and it reminds me of one of my favorite facts, and that is when you reprocess or cut up the irradiated fuel rods, that all kinds of creepy stuff, of course, gets released. But um, people say that nuclear power is carbon-free, and it really is not, because when you have reprocessing the fuel rods and cut them out, radioactive carbon-14 and in the form of carbon di radioactive carbon dioxide is released into the environment. And nobody talks about that. And just, so it, it is not really, I don't know where origin is. Just as an aside, and I, I've spoken uh, with the organizers of this program, and I understand that DU radioactive weaponry and or tritium weaponry will not be on the agenda, but I would like to encourage anyone who's interested in discussing this and the health effects and the use on all of today's battlefields by America and all of her allies of so-called DU, uh, which is not depleted, as you know, uranium weaponry, radioactive weaponry. And um, anyone who would be interested in discussing this, I am available. I can tell you that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of veterans are coming home ill from our battlefields as well as the fact that we are leaving behind uh, radioactive wastelands in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. And they're also now deploying this, I think, in drones. So if anyone is interested, I could give you my number. It's 775-412-5980, 775-412-5980. Uh, I am bi-coastal. I live in Libertyville, Illinois, in a house and an office contributed to the project, and also in Nevada. As an aside, as a, a 
a long time observer of uh, shenanigans in uh, Nevada, I can tell you that routinely waste is shipped into the Nevada test site and buried. Despite the fact that one is not aware of it, there's no discussion of this, it's a routine advent and the people are accepting it, unfortunately. So anyway, all the best, everybody. I'll look forward to speaking with you. Thank you very much. I would like to talk with you. And I'd like to thank Kay for your very informative presentation. Thank you so much, Kay, for your decades of work. For years, people have put together photo collages for special occasions. They go through the photo album and old shoe boxes and pull out their favorite photos and put them on poster boards. The boards are a great way of sharing stories, but it can be a pretty tedious job. But we here at Clocks, we want to make that job easier for you. So just bring us all the photos and we'll scan them into the computer and then we'll print out the collages on our large format printer. That way, all the photos will be in digital format so you can share them with your friends and relatives. The Glenside and Northside pubs, from sandwiches, burgers, and Mexican food, to starters, salads, soups, and desserts, not to mention their specialty pizzas, like Hawaiian, vegetarian, chicken alfredo, and of course their grand finale. It's the Glenside and Northside pubs. ASAP Auto Sales, located at 2486 South Getty Street in Muskegon, offers a wide selection of reasonably priced used vehicles from cars and trucks to vans, SUVs, and four-wheel drives. With new selections coming in every day, ASAP lot is always full, which means whenever you drop in, there's about 100 vehicles to choose from. With a wide selection of vehicles, both domestic and import, they have it all. ASAP Auto Sales, 231-830-9000. Established in 1973 by Paul M. Lattice, Lattice & Hoops Law Offices has been a multi-service law firm specializing in accident cases, personal injury, wrongful death, social security disability, divorce, probate and wills, and real estate. When it comes to choosing the right attorney for your legal needs, don't choose out of town, choose local legal counsel. It really pays. It's experience when it counts. It's Lattice & Hoops Law Offices.
perhaps our youngest attendee participant, 19 years old from both the Anke Owingi yeah, and Santa Clara Pueblos. Yay. Youth coordinator for Honor of Pueblo Existence and Think Outside the Long TOTV and a member of Tewa Women, Women United's Environmental Justice Group. Growing up around strong anti-nuclear mentors, let's think of all of us older ones as being able to fill that role. He began his learning and activism around nuclear issues at a very, very early age. For the past 12 years, he's been educating peer community members about the environmental and health risks of working at or living in close proximity to Los Alamos National Laboratory. Traveling speaker on the 2010 National TOTV Tour, he is passionate about educating students in New Mexico so that they may make informed decisions before pursuing work at um, Los Alamos National Laboratory. And I want to remind everyone that each participant has come with an action plan, a request, and I'm hoping that each one of you will end your presentations with what you want all of us to be doing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Uh, wonderful to be here. I just want to thank every single one of you guys for being out here. Um, I really learned a lot from over the years, traveling and talking about these issues. Um, learned a lot from my grandmother. Learned a lot from her friends and her mentors as well. And I'm truly blessed of all the things that I've been able to see, of all the things that I've been able to learn over these past 12 years. Um, like I said, I'm a 19-year-old from the Pueblos of Oquia, in San Juan, to Pueblo in uh, northern New Mexico. Uh, tribal, uh, our tribe has been in the area that it's been for thousands and thousands of years, uh, near the Los Alamos National Laboratories. And you know, uh, the cultural significance of living in this area near the labs is just you know, so great. As, as far back as I can remember, you know, living, that's, that's what I know, you know, even my grandmother, my great-grandmother, 70 years of these laboratories being there, that's pretty much what we've been accustomed to. You know, uh, I'm gonna start out with uh, talking about the youth. I think the youth, are the most important thing right now. The education of these youth, they're the future leaders. They're the ones who are gonna hold the positions of power pretty soon. You know, sometimes we take for granted the little things in life. You know, being able to go to the sink, turn on the water, to take a drink of water, to breathe, to take that bit of fresh air, to be able to go to your neighbor and to greet your neighbor with a smile. We take all these little things for granted. In my community, there's a lot of issues. Some people go hungry at night. There's a really big drug issue in my community. Right next door, we have the richest county in the United States of America the most millionaires per capita in the United States of America. And in my community, people struggle. How are we going to get the next meal? How are we going to send our children to school? Well, there's not very many options. The number one provider of jobs in my community, Los Alamos National Laboratories. The number two provider of jobs in my community, Walmart. Exactly. So see, growing up, all my life, you know, I see people, my uncles and my aunties, you know, working at the laboratories, you know, sure, they're driving nice cars and making $20, $30 an hour, but that's the bottom of the list, you know. They're going, they're doing the work, they're going and cleaning this waste, they're moving this waste. They're having to sacrifice their lives in order to support their families. And you have other people working two, three jobs just to support their families. I mean, it's life. Life is so, so short. Life is so precious. We don't deserve. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve all this cancer that's going around. 
know, I have a friend, you know, her brother, 21 years old, security guard at Los Alamos, passed away to acute radiation exposure. 21 years old. 21 years old. It's amazing how many people overlook these little things. Overlook how precious each and every one of us is. Each and every mind, everybody out there. That's why I have to educate. We have to teach these people. We gotta teach these children. We gotta go into the schools and tell them. Like I said, my community, the labs have been in my community for almost 70 years. When I go to schools, when I do presentations, I ask how many people, you know, have family members working at the labs, you know, 95, 96, 97% of the people raise their hands. And when I ask, do you know what they do up there? Not a single hand. It's amazing. My grandmother, almost 90 years old, her, her son works there. You know, her, she basically been there as long as she could remember. And she still doesn't have a clue what's going on. Has no idea. Has no idea that in our cultural homeland, this threat exists. It could all be taken away in an instant. You know, people have been there for thousands and thousands of years. Where would we go if something was to go wrong? Where would we go? That's our homeland. That place is special to me. Inside, in my heart. It's where I'm from. It's who I am. And it's my duty in life to protect that. To stand up and say and do what's right. Because that's not right. I'm sure it provides jobs. <coughs> sure, they do some good things in Los Alamos, but the majority of their work is nuclear weapons, plutonium. I say that one more time, I get chills every time I hear that word, plutonium. You got one particle of plutonium, it's considered potentially hazardous to human health, that particle's one-tenth the size of the thickness of the human hair. Tiny, tiny little particles. They have 5,000 pounds of it, 2.5 metric tons sitting in a vault. 20 miles away from where I lie my head down to rest every night. And not, it's scary. It scares me because not everybody knows. People go on with their daily lives like whatever. It's just a part of our daily lives. It's not a part of our daily lives. It shouldn't be a part of our daily lives. It shouldn't. We should have options. We should have the ability to go and support our families without having to make that ultimate sacrifice. It should be available to all of us. I have a feeling that a day will come when we can stand together and rise up. The children of our community can look to one another and realize the truth, the truth that has been so long overlooked all these years, the truth of life. Because that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. Life. The ability to wake up in the morning, to open your eyes, to get up, and to see the world, to enjoy this world. We only got one world. I said the water, the air, everything around us. We gotta protect that. And that's why I'm here today. Thank you so much. Muskegon Area District Library, formerly the Muskegon County Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. Offering public library books and magazines, both fiction and nonfiction, to visually and physically impaired individuals with their new location at 4845 Airline Road. They can be contacted at 231-737-6310.
For nearly nine years, West Michigan Driving Academy has been providing Muskegon County with complete, comprehensive driver's education. Students spend time both in the classroom and on the road in a state-approved driver's education vehicle with state-certified instructors. West Michigan Driving Academy is the only school in Muskegon that offers both day and evening classes throughout the summer. Accident-free with 150 years of combined experience, you will drive safe at West Michigan Driving Academy. Surrey and the Fruitport area for over 40 years, Grover Pharmacy offers a full line of vitamins, supplements, and homeopathic medicines, as well as a variety of glucometers, blood pressure kits, baby care items, bandages, and wound care products. They carry office and school supplies, Russell Stover candies, promotional and seasonal items, and Hallmark cards and gifts. Grover Pharmacy, they take time to care about you. Hi, I'm Brenda Harris with Nexus Realty, turning dreams into an address. I support DSE TV. Our house was about seven miles from the facility, although we had no idea at the time. 
when my two sisters were born and then my brother, um, my father's law practice was doing a little bit better and we decided to, uh, they decided to move into a new house uh, in a new subdivision out, uh, out by Rocky Flats and at that point we were about two and a half, three miles from the plant. Again, we had no idea. Uh, this is a picture of, of me at our first house right before we moved. And I, I just show this because it's kind of neat. If you look closely, we didn't know, I didn't notice this until the book actually came out. But uh, my parents, my family has been incredibly supportive of this book. It was a very difficult book to write from a personal standpoint as well as all the research involved. And my family was very, very supportive. And in this photo, you can see my mother sitting right behind me. And that's my father's shadow on the ground. So it's kind of a neat, neat thing. There was a secret in our neighborhood. This plant is located just between Boulder and Denver. Uh, it's about uh, eight, nine miles from Boulder and about 11 miles from Denver. The Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Plant began operations, secret operations, in 1952. It was owned by the Atomic Energy Commission, now of course the Department of Energy, and it was operated by Dow Chemical. This is a shot of the actual plutonium production facility. We could see the water tower from our back porch. Our house was a little further out than this, um, but uh, so we could see the water tower and that was about it. Uh, most of the buildings, there were eventually more than 800 buildings at Rocky Flats. Um, but, uh, some of them were partially or fully underground. You couldn't see anything from the road. Here's an aerial view of Rocky Flats. You can see how large the facility is. My house. <laughs> idea of perspective. We didn't know it was there. Um, we didn't know it was produced at Rocky Flats. When I was a kid, it was operated by Dow Chemical. The rumor in, in my neighborhood was that they were making household cleaning supplies. My mother thought they were making scrubbing bubbles. They weren't making scrubbing bubbles. From 1952 to 1989, Rocky Flats produced more than 70,000 plutonium pits or triggers for nuclear weapons at a cost of $45 million apiece. Each trigger, as you know, contains enough breathable particles of plutonium to kill every person on Earth. Workers weren't allowed to talk about their work, even to their own families. When I began my formal research for this project, I was stunned to discover how many different things, you know, how many different things people believed that Rocky Flats produced. We thought they were making scrubbing bubbles. Other people thought they were making glass doorknobs or fertilizer. You know, there were all sorts of rumors in the neighborhood. And part of that was because there was intentional misrepresentation on the part of the plant uh, by Dow Chemical and Rockwell. And there's no doubt of that. But it's also a, when you have a workers in a facility where they can't talk about what they do and a policy of containment where workers in one area are not allowed to know what workers in another area are doing. When people go home to have suppers with their family at, at night with their families, they will sometimes make things up. So the workers make things up too to tell their kids, well, you know, dad's just making the you know, doorknobs or whatever. So it was incredible how many rumors there were about what actually happened at the plant. And again, we didn't know. Rocky Flats produced plutonium triggers, but its biggest output was toxic and radioactive waste. Hanford supplied the plutonium for Rocky Flats, and thank you, and Oak Ridge supplied the enriched uranium. The uh, triggers themselves were then sent on to pan pantex where they were encased in conventional explosives. One of the things that um, workers said uh, when out at the plant, certainly when I worked out of, at the plant, uh, was this idea that, well, we're not really making the bomb itself. Of course, we were. But people would justify it or rationalize it to themselves sometimes by saying, well, it's going someplace else to be encased in a conventional explosive. We're not the one who's pulling the trigger. We're not the one who's actually doing doing the bomb work. We're just messing around with plutonium triggers. Here's a photo of a glove box at Rocky Flats. And yet, as you can see, workers would put their arms and hands into lead-lined gloves and look through a Benelux plastic shielding window. Here's another photo of a glove box lying at Rocky Flats. And you can see how these uh, boxes are linked. Plutonium, as I'm sure you know, is highly flammable. There were many, many fires at Rocky Flats. Over the course of almost 40 years, there were more than 200 fires at Rocky Flats, two big ones that I'm going to talk about very briefly. But part of the reason that why the fires were such a problem 
So not only is it difficult to put out a plutonium fire, you can't use water on, on plutonium without risking that criticality, but it travels very quickly through these glove box lines, and if something sparks and moves through the lines, it races through the entire line very quickly. Here's another shot. This is one of my favorite shots of a glove box. This is a repacking glove box. This is kind of eerie. <laughs> um, there were many, many problems with storage at Rocky Flats. We had more, more waste, particularly plutonium waste, than we knew what to do with. There are numbers of stories that I talk about in the book. There was a red box, there were box cars, for example, filled with waste when Idaho didn't want it, and Nevada didn't want it, and we didn't know where to send it. Sometimes there would be box cars that would travel around the country full of radioactive waste, not unlike the, the barge in New York, you know, <laughs> remember that, and up and down the coastline. But waste was a huge problem at Rocky Flats, uh, where to store it, what to do with it. Uh, we were at our limit. Uh, when I worked out at Rocky Flats, I was working next to more than 14 tons of, 14 tons of plutonium, and I, I didn't know. Is your loved one's health failing? Do they need the aid and attendance of other people for their daily living activities? Were they a veteran? If so, it is possible that they are eligible for a special pension called Aid in Attendance through the Veterans Administration that will assist in paying for their health care needs. There are four eligibility factors to consider, and you can find out if your loved one is eligible for any of these benefits just by making a phone call to Elder Law Attorney Anna Duggins. She can be reached at 231-722-5415, or you can email her at AUD at parmenterlaw.com. The Village at Park Terrace Senior Living Community, offering beautiful yet affordable one and two bedroom apartment homes as well as two bedroom cottages. Rent includes a wide variety of exceptional services, from daily meals shared in the dining room or delivered to your door, to scheduled activities and social events, to 24-hour emergency on-call service. Their expert, caring staff is there to assist you with all of your retirement needs. The Village at Park Terrace Senior Living Community, where you can enjoy the luxuries and comfort of your own home without the work and worry. Your vehicle is an important part of your life. It gets you where you need to go. Take care of it by bringing it to Vans Car Wash and Quick Lube. At Vans Quick Lube, every vehicle gets up to six quarts of high-quality Quaker State oils, new oil filter, and a free car wash with every service. If you need a quick wash that is done right the first time, then stop by any convenient Vans Car Wash and experience the hand-scrubbed and Simonized difference. Keep your car running and looking great at Vans Car Wash and Quick Lube. Six convenient locations, one near you. Incinerator routinely released plutonium and other contaminants 
into the atmosphere, and it was one of the uh, issues that led to the FBI raid in 1989 on Rocky Flats. I believe it's the only time in the history of our country that two government agencies, the FBI and the EPA, have raided another, the, the Department of Energy. And I could say much about that, but I don't have the time. Uh, but this is, this is one of the reasons um, that raid happened. Another was the, I'll just mention briefly, Pond Creek, which was an attempt on the part of uh, Rocky Flats to um, mix plutonium with concrete. And they created thousands of these blocks that were the size of small refrigerators. Uh, and uh, workers at the plant eventually called it the jelly factory because it never hardened and you could, it was like jello and you could stick your thumbs and this, your thumb into this stuff. And it also, it was stored outside and a lot of that stuff seeped into the environment. So Pond Creek was another reason why we had this uh, secret FBI raid. This is a very quick shot of known waste and burial sites at Rocky Flats. These two creeks, uh, one of them, Walnut Creek flows down into Stanley Lake. My house is right on the edge of Stanley Lake there. Um, the interesting thing here is known waste implies unknown waste. Is there unknown waste? Yes, there is. The site has never been fully characterized. This is a shot of an infinity room. These were sites, these were places, um, rooms on site where uh, Something happened, something had occurred in a short period of time, a long period of time, where the room was so profoundly contaminated that it was, it was just completely sealed. This particular room has a jackhammer inside of it from the 1950s, and it was closed forever. Um, I mentioned the problem of waste. Unknown to the public, more than 5,000 barrels stood out in the open for more than 11 years. My house is kind of right over here on the side. Boulder's up here, Denver's over there. What happened with these barrels? They rusted out. Radioactive toxic material leaked into the soil, contaminated groundwater, and was carried off site. The public was not informed. There were two big fires in Rocky, at Rocky Flats, one in 1957, the year before I was born, that was so big that it burned out um, all of the, uh, not just all the filters, 620 filters, but also all of the measuring equipment. Again, there was no warning or information available to the public. The second big fire was in 1969, the year after my family, the year that my family moved out to our new house that was even closer. Here, a worker is pointing to um, the box where the, fires, the 1957 fire started. Here you can see a shot of the burned out filters. Plutonium was detected in a school playground 12 miles away. And uh, later, plutonium from these fires and from the barrels was detected as far as 30 miles away. So essentially, uh, there's a 30-mile radius that extends well into the metro Denver area uh, of, of land that was contaminated by Rocky Flats. Now I want to re return briefly to my family story. Again, I wanted to put a human face on a kind of inhumane story. This is our Christmas photo right after we moved out to the plant. This is the first love of my life. <laughs> and I wanted to show this because some of you have read the book and everyone says, what happened to Tonka? Here's a picture of Tonka. Uh, we often went swimming in Stanley Lake with our horses and our dogs, and that lake has plutonium in the sediment. It's another shot of Tonka. <laughs> well, horses get old, but you know, I just want to say, Three minutes. Okay, I'm going to go through real quick here to the rest of them. Um, but I will just say one thing. Uh, animals are very important in the book, and it's in the animals that we first see the effects of plutonium. We think strontium was detected in the bones of horses right down the road from my house. Um, you can see how open and windswept this land is. This is all housing development now. This is the path of the 1969 fire and the 1957 fire over our house and over the metro Denver area. These are areas of contamination around Rocky Flats. My house is right near Stanley Lake there in the third level. As I said, it was in animals that we began to see plutonium and other evidence. This is a Department of Energy memo that talks about radioactive rabbits in the area. Note that this uh, is dated 1961. We didn't discover it. We didn't find out about this until the 1990s. 
There are great stories in the book about activism out at Rocky Flats. I don't have time to go into it today, so I'm just going to flip through some of these photos. Sally Ginsburg. Some of you may know Dr. Leroy Moore. Or Jackie Brever, one of the whistleblowers out of the plant that helped, uh, her work helped lead to the raid. Wes McKinley, foreman of the runaway grand jury. It's a great story. This is uh, me with my two boys when I went to work at the plant. This is what the plant looked like when I went to work out there. Workers at the plant. I had no idea what was going on at Rocky Flats. One night I came home and there was a Nightline expose on television and they were interviewing people that I worked with. And that was the first time that I heard exactly what was going on and knew that I was working in a very dangerous area. I'll uh, end with two quick slides. Um, one is uh, when I was working at Rocky Flats, I kept coming across this acronym for MUF. I was MUF, what's MUF? It stands for Missing Unaccounted for Plutonium. Over the course of the year, uh, almost 40 years, Rocky Flats misplaced or lost more than 3,000 pounds of plutonium. Many workers became ill. It's Charlie Wolf, one of the managers I work with. These people have, uh, he's since passed away. You may be aware of Charlie Wolf legislation that we're trying to, the Charlie Wolf Act, that we're trying to get through. This is a young woman right down the road from me who's had several brain tumors. I don't have time to talk about the cleanup, but suffice to say that it is a very controversial cleanup. A lot of people call it a cover-up rather than a cleanup. And what are we doing right now? We are uh, at the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge. Although 1,300 acres are so profoundly contaminated, they can never be open to the public. The rest of the site, 4,000 acres, is slated to open for public recreation, hiking, and biking. Even though there is, uh, there are very uh, controversial levels of contamination, and we are building new houses on contaminated land right next to Rocky Flats, and these people who buy these houses are not informed that the land is contaminated. These are the three things that I'll end here. I know I've, I've pushed my time. These are the things that we need to do most immediately. I have information. If anyone like to would like to help us with this. Stop the construction of homes and, par and uh, highways going through contaminated land. Prevent the wildlife refuge from opening to the public. That's my number one thing. And uh, halt Department of Interior plans for Rocky Mountain Greenway projects, hiking trails through the Rocky Flats land. So, um, thank you so much for your patience. When your transmission is in trouble, it is important to find reliable and honest mechanics. National Transmission will get the job done right. Located at 4037 East Apple Avenue in Muskegon, you can call them at 231-788-3244. Pizza Ranch, featuring a buffet that is guaranteed to please even the pickiest eaters. From a full soup and salad bar, pizzas and breadsticks, to mouth-watering roasted chicken, potatoes and gravy, vegetables, drinks and desserts, all for just one price. Their menu features a wide variety of delectable favorites. You can dine in, carry out, or have your meals delivered. There's something for everyone at the Pizza Ranch. At Langlois Home Furnishing in Muskegon, we've been serving West Michigan for over 65 years. Langlois is a local family-owned store with national buying power. We carry the largest selection of mattresses from Serta in West Michigan. Plus, we can help with design ideas. We also have a great selection of the latest top brand appliances and HDTVs. Discover what's new for you at Langlois Home Furnishings on Henry Street in Muskegon.
very happy to introduce the only one of the panelists that I know from before. Great to meet new people and also to welcome back someone who's been so helpful and valuable to this movement. Dr. Jeff Patterson is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. He's currently beginning a second term as president of Physicians for Social Responsibility. He's the medical director of the Hackett Hemwall Foundation, which does charitable work in third world countries. Um, in his Physicians for Social Responsibility work, he's traveled to Russia, former USSR many, many times, visited Chernobyl and Japan, and I know um, just this uh, past summer in Fukushima. He lectures widely on the medical effects of radiation as well as on the nuclear industrial complex, which includes nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Welcome, Jeff. It's uh, just a real pleasure and privilege to be here with all of you. And I, judging from what we've heard so far, everybody has fascinating stories that I, I love to hear. And uh, it's um, uh, an honor to be here with so many august people in this movement, uh, people that I know well and some that I don't know well and look forward to meeting. Um, so, uh, thank you. Uh, as Norma said, I'm Jeff Patterson and I'm Professor Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and current incoming president of Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, PSR uh, is the uh, U.S. affiliate of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, founded in 1961-62, sort of a two-year process. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary uh, this year and last year, uh, and the affiliate of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985. Founded by Dr. Bernard Loud, who's 90, 91 years old now, a famous cardiologist in Boston, and still very active and very interested in uh, all of this uh, stuff. Um, we published the first article, really, on the medical effects of radiation. Prior to that, there was a lot of secrecy, uh, some of which we've heard about. Uh, and this was the medical consequences of thermonuclear war. And this, along with the Tooth Fairy project that was done in St. Louis, uh, that we're now looking to resurrect uh, this year, uh, since this is not, a, not only the 70th anniversary of the first nuclear reaction this year, it's the 50th anniversary of PSR, it's also the 50th anniversary of the limited test ban. And that Tooth Fairy project, where we found strontium 90 in children's teeth, resulted in Kennedy and Khrushchev signing the above ground test ban that put testing underground, did some good things, kept a lot of radiation out of the atmosphere, but it really accelerated the nuclear arms race because it allowed people to just go right ahead and develop new nuclear weapons and all of those plutonium jets that, uh, uh, that we saw in Rocky Flats. Well, it really is about the waste. To paraphrase a famous political statement, it's the waste, stupid. Um, and I was at uh, Bill McKibben's uh, talk the other night in uh, Madison, and the head of uh, uh, Wisconsin Clean Energy said, well, nuclear energy's got to be a part of this. And so we got into a discussion about that. And one of the things she said is, well, one of my physicist friends says, the waste is not a problem. <coughs> this is the mentality uh, that out, is out there. And it's about the waste all along the nuclear fuel cycle, from the time we dig it out of the ground till we have to put it in storage, the processing all along the way, the stuff we heard, heard about at Rocky Flats, and the nuclear weapons. This is another uh, big piece of it. And the problem with the waste is it's radioactive, and it's going to be radioactive for thousands and thousands of years. We're talking about the nuclear industrial complex, and the nuclear industrial complex includes nuclear weapons and nuclear power. They are hand in glove. They are two sides of the same coin. They are Siamese twins. They are one in the same, and anybody who argues they're not is not somehow mentally grounded. Uh, and they are because nuclear weapons were developed, and then out of that, thanks to Eisenhower and the peaceful atom, came nuclear power to justify nuclear weapons in Europe. And now, out of nuclear power, we're seeing the birth of nuclear weapons. India, Pakistan, Israel, Iran, uh, and probably other countries are going to move in this direction. They are one and the same. It's no coincidence that the country's getting rid of nuclear power, Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, etc. None of them have nuclear weapons. The countries that continue to push it, all of us have nuclear weapons. 
the nuclear industrial complex, I like three things. You know, they say in, in uh, uh, talking about things, you need three things. I guess it's a holy number, you know. So the hallmarks of the nuclear industrial complex are secrecy, cover-up, and minimization. Secrecy, we heard about. Cover-up, cover-up's a polite name for lying. If you can't keep it a secret, you lie about it. And then minimization. And you've all heard that. How many of you have heard the phrase, uh, after a release of radiation, no harm to human health here? <laughs> all right. If I were a certain politician, I'd bet you $10,000 that you will never hear the nuclear industry say, well, that leak of radiation is going to cost 10,000 cancers. It just won't happen. That's the minimization that goes on. There are three poisonous peas in the nuclear industrial complex. And that is price. It's also expensive, whether you're talking about weapons or power. But we really can't afford it. Pollution, and that's what we're talking about with the waste today. And proliferation, the development of nuclear weapons. And what we're interested in is radiation in the nuclear industrial complex, because that's what affects us and affects the biosphere around us. So it's important to realize that there is no safe dose of radiation. Don't let anybody argue you out of that. That is a fundamental point. And we know that because of the Beer Report for the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation, the Academy of Sciences, that says that there's a direct linear relationship between dose and cancers. And that's just cancers, and that's a tiny part of the effects of radiation. What else it does to our immune systems, to our thought processes, to all of the biological things that go on in our lives, and the lives of the plants and animals and trees, et cetera, around us, we don't know a lot about, frankly. We do know a lot about this because of people like Alice Stewart. Alice Stewart was a wonderful physician in England, beautiful woman, a lovely person. Uh, I always love to meet with her and talk with her. And she did the Oxford Project, which looked at the effects of radiation on fetuses and found that the effects of radiation on fetuses were profound. That is, that one x-ray of an unborn fetus, and the younger the fetus is, the worse it is, caused an increased chance of leukemia in that fetus by one and a half to two times. One x-ray. Now, when I started practice, we used to routinely x-ray women in pregnancy. They'd come in labor, and we'd x-ray their pelvis, two or three x-rays, just to find out if the baby would fit through the pelvis. Totally meaningless study. Worthless, worthless, worthless. And yet, we caused a lot of leukemias, not to mention the other effects that go along with radiation. And Alice was ridiculed by the nuclear industrial complex. Ridiculed, called names, uh, laughed at, uh, derided, etc. And of course, now we don't x-ray women in pregnancy because we know this is true. And that's not a lot of radiation. Not a lot of radiation. The amount that we don't know about radiation far exceeds the amount that we do know. And that includes things like external versus internal radiation. Uh, One-time exposure versus constant exposure from internal radiation. The epigenetics and the bystander effects. You affect one cell and it sends messages to cells around it that go on for generation to generation. These are all things that we know virtually nothing about. And of course, the radiation leaks out all along the fuel cycle. From the time we dig it out of the ground, those tailings that I showed you, the enriching, the conversion, nuclear weapons, nuclear explosions, down to the point where we have to store it. And as John Goffman used to say, you know, it's not really so much about the end point, how much you have to put in the bank. It's how much leaks out all along the way. And that's what we're talking about here because that's what affects us. Because it gets in our environment, in our food cycle. Gets in the grass, the cows eat the grass, gets in the milk, my granddaughter drinks the milk, she gets the radiation in her thyroid, uh, and on and on it goes, and it cycles around and around. You know, the fish have cesium, cesium has a certain half-life, biological half-life, they poop it out, and then other animals eat that poop, uh, and it just gets recycled because it never goes away. Jimmy John's? Jimmy John's here. What took you so long? Jimmy John's, freaky fast delivery. I love a man in uniform. Jimmy John's, freaky fast delivery.
Northway Lane, 1751 Evanston Avenue in Muskegon, featuring 50 auto score lanes, cosmic bowling, billiards, a cafe and banquet facility, lounge and pro shop. Looking for somewhere to hold your child's next birthday party? Northway Lanes can supply everything you need, from invitations and decorations to personal pizzas, hot dogs and fries, to soft drinks, ice cream and goodie bags, even a private party room. Appliance shopping can be confusing. At Seaway Appliance, we make it easy as one, two, three. One, we have a great selection of home appliances to choose from, and we offer competitive pricing. Two, the staff is friendly and knowledgeable, and our customers can enjoy a no-pressure experience. Three, we have our own professional service department. Plus, because we're a brand source store, you know you're getting the best deal possible, saving you money. Where are you going to shop for your next appliance or TV? Seaway Appliance, thank you for your business. Seaway Appliance. And you can see the difference in them. 
It's so arrogant of us to think that cancer is the only problem we have to deal with when this is happening to our environment, to the plants, the animals around us, our whole ecosystem. We are the height of arrogance. And barn swallows around Chernobyl, a recent study by Professor Mousseau and others, reduced population 26 years later by 43%, males 24%, females 57%, because you women are much more sensitive than we men are to radiation. And excess annual mortality of 1.8 million birds a year. So how much wildlife has died because of this? And of course, now they're building a new sarcophagus over the plant uh, at the cost of $16 billion. And uh, they just started part of it. They're going to roll this over the plant. It's supposed to last for 100 years. Who's going to build the next one and at what cost? This plant was supposed to last 10 years. We're now 26 years out. What's going to happen? And of course, then we moved to Fukushima, where we had the huge explosions there, which left total devastation, which left the fuel pools that uh, Bob Alvarez will probably talk about as an expert on this. Uh, exposed 60 feet in the air, the cooling systems went down, and these might catch fire. And then we have a radioactive fire that's lofting smoke into the upper atmosphere that goes around the world that we probably can't put out because nobody can get in there to do it. And yet we have some 24 plants exactly like this in the United States with the, the fuel pools up in the air. And uh, again, uh, Bob can talk a lot more about those. Well, this resulted in huge evacuations, about 140,000, nobody knows for sure how many people, because they continue to leave. Uh, towns and villages left just empty in the area. The evacuation was kind of chaotic, uh, because they didn't know how much more radiation was going to come out. I mean, ideally, they should have just left people sheltering and then done it in a more organized winter, but nobody knew what was going to happen. So it left things like this. This is a pig in a feed shop. Uh, you know, has been in here foraging for food because the animals were left behind and left. And people were made to move into these little cardboard box shelters and gymnasiums and schools, etc. And then moved into shelters like this uh, woman. And now I visited uh, the area, this is a village called Kawachi, uh, just a few weeks ago. And these little shelters, and I visited one of the women living in this, and she said, I'm being driven crazy here because this place is so small. My house was so nice, and she doesn't know if she's ever going to go back to her house. And this is what we're doing. Families separated. I saw women who are getting divorced because they moved south, uh, and their men are still working in the uh, Fukushima area. It's a horrible social situation. Well, we went to Fukushima and measured the radiation. This is a rice paddy, and this was a beautiful rice paddy area, now just overgrown. And this farmer had built this pond here and put ducks in it, thinking the ducks were going to eat the bugs coming out of the field and decontaminate the field, because the bugs were going to eat the cesium, and then the ducks would eat the cesium bugs. And that was the way he was going to decontaminate the field, so hopefully he could grow rice here again. Um, and fields, uh, schoolyards, where the soil is taken up, but then it's just put under tarps like this. They don't know what to do with this stuff. Where are you going to take it? What are you going to do with it? How long will the tarps last that all this stuff is wrapped in? This is a clinic we visited, and you can see the steep mountainside right behind the clinic. And they had gone up that mountain and scraped off all the, the, fore, uh, the foliage underneath it, put a, a fence up there where you were not supposed to cross because they hadn't cleaned anything up, cut all the branches off those trees up, and you saw this quite commonly on the mountainsides. But you know, the, the rain comes, the snow comes, and the season just runs right down the hill. It comes back again. And then what do you do with all the stuff that's there? These monitoring stations around, where they would monitor the amount of radiation. This is all being cleaned up, a concrete pad under it. And this is the radiation level, 0.24 uh, microsieverts. Uh, and it was the same on the ground and in the air around it. But about 30 feet away on the ground, that's the radiation level, twice as much, not cleaned up. So this results in contaminated food, 400,000 cans of powdered formula recalled made 200 kilometers south of Fukushima. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And do they measure all the food? All the food? These are some of the food products that have been withdrawn or banned. Uh, rock trout uh, off uh, one kilometer off uh, the city, uh, 38,000 becquerels. And bluefin tuna off California was easy. <coughs> So again, the hallmarks of the nuclear industrial complex are secrecy, cover-up, and minimization. 
that continues. These are lead shields that were passed out to TEPCO workers to put over their radiation badges so they could go and spend more time in higher radiation areas. And they, of course, denied that this was the case, but then it became known that that was the case. It continues all the time. It's very important for us not to lose sight of the forest for the trees. The trees are these trees from Chernobyl that I've shown you, and they are the studies that may show that this dose of radiation or that dose are harmful or not harmful or produce this effect and that effect. That's, it's important not to get lost in that stuff because you can get caught up in arguments and discussions all day long. The important thing is that half of Chernobyl's exclusion zone is forest that may catch fire and the cesium may be lofted back into the atmosphere. And that the military industrial or the nuclear industrial complex is blanketing the earth with unmeasured amounts of radiation which will affect the environment, our children, our grandchildren, generations to come for thousands and thousands of years. That's the important thing that we have to focus on all the time. Bombing, leakage, accidents, it truly is about the waste, stupid. Einstein says, Einstein said the splitting of the atom has changed everything save our modes of thinking and thus we drift to our end parallel catastrophe. What I would like you to do is go to our PS website and join thousands of email activists. You go to the main website, it's right over there on the right. Join us, sign up to receive PSR email alerts. We'll send you alerts about things that you can do easily on email, with letters, etc. And I'd love to see many of you join. I also have a clipboard if you want to put your email address and name down. I'll see that you get on the list, but this is a real easy way uh, to do it. We have a beautiful planet. I'm so glad that all of you are here. And I'm so, again, honored to be here with many of you who have been so active in this for many, many years. Thank you very much. Your child's education matters. That's why at Muskegon Public Schools, we encourage early childhood development by providing childcare, preschool, and Head Start. Two-way language immersion and academically focused after-school activities are also an option. High school students benefit from advanced placement classes, nationally recognized athletics and fine arts, and the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. For more information or to enroll, call 720-2000. Muskegon Public Schools, providing the best for every child, every day. jewelry browser looking for an extraordinary engagement ring, a couple celebrating your 60th anniversary, or you're just looking to treat yourself or mark an important event, Prothyme and Swanson Gemworks is proud to offer custom-made selections handcrafted in America. Silver, fine-colored gems, diamonds and gold jewelry, as well as strands of lustrous quality pearls. From ring and watch appraisals to in-house jewelry design and repair, ring sizing, remounting, to a complete rebuilding, you can rely on them to keep your old favorites looking new. K&S Gemworks, Muskegon's community jeweler. Memories made one at a time. Muskegon's Hackley Public Library is an excellent source for help, information, and great entertainment on virtually any topic. The friendly, knowledgeable staff is always available to help you with finding information on any topic you need. They can help you with using the free public access computers, and they look forward to showing you books, audio CDs, DVDs, and much more. Whether you live in the city or outside, the Hackley Public Library in downtown Muskegon is there to help with everything imaginable.
on our panel. She's the founder and coordinator of Defenders of the Black Hills, an all-volunteer organization which won the International Nuclear Free Future Award in 2007 for resistance. She's a scientist, former college instructor, writer, and organizer. She speaks to the issue of nuclear waste from the beginning of the nuclear cycle at the place where the mining of uranium occurs. Charmaine comes from the center of the North American continent. The work of Defenders covers all of Western South Dakota, parts of North Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, and Nebraska. First I said, I greet each and every one of you with a handshake from my heart. And then I told you one of my names, my common name is Zumila Wabaga. It means a little wise one who makes a mark. And then I said, I am from the Oglala band of the people who speak the Lakota language, the Lakota dialect, from the Great Sioux Nation, the Otetishakoi. And I'm very, very happy to be here today. Um, <clears throat> what I'm, I've come today in my traditional clothes, first to let you know that I am really actual Native American person. My grandmother's grandmother was at the Custer fight, where we live in the middle of uh, the country, where is right behind the weatherman stands, you know, he stands there, South Dakota is right behind him. West Coast is over here, East Coast is over here. We're, we're the forgotten area right behind him. A little bit, just to tell you who we are, this, um, this <clears throat> the first picture, and if you see the purple, and you'll notice uh, Chicago is, Chicago is about right there. Okay. This whole territory here was the original territory of the Great Sioux Nation. It's huge. But the concept of territory with the, with the indigenous people is different than the Western European concept. Because there were other many other nations who lived in there, who lived in this area too. Also, this whole area right here. So it has to die. There we go. That was the whole Great Sioux Nation once upon a time. And where I come from, oh, it did die, is almost right there, right there. That's where I live in Rapid City. This is South Dakota, and this is North Dakota, Montana, Wyoming. Eventually, we made a treaty with the United States. We made a number of them, starting first with France in 1806. Um, and then they kept coming forward until 1868, when my, my great-great-grandparents were alive. And <clears throat> the final territory that we made, the final treaty we made, was the 1868, and that's in the, the darker color right there, and where it says the Great Sioux, great Sioux Reservation. The Great Sioux Reservation is all of western South Dakota. But we were placed on prisoner of war camps within that, so that when they discovered gold in the Black Hills. <clears throat> and this, this uh, area that I'm going to be talking to you about is the Great Sioux Nation, uh, the last treaty territory, this dark area right here, and including the Great Sioux Reservation. There we go. This dark area right here is the area I'm going to be talking about. This was the last treaty territory that we have with the United States. It's called the 1868 Treaty. It has never been abrogated. I mean, it has been abrogated <coughs> excuse me, by the United States, but it's not legally abrogated. Um, and this is what we call America's Secret Treaty. Standing Rock Reservation, Cheyenne River Reservation, Lower, Lower Brule Reservation, Crow Creek Reservation, Rosebud Reservation, and Pine Ridge Reservation. And this is the reservation that I come from. I grew up about right in the middle of there. <clears throat> this is South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming. 
Now, this, this map I received from the U.S. Forest Service a number of years ago because all of these little yellow places right here, all of those are abandoned uranium mines of prospects. All of them are. This, um, this is just a, a short to show you the, where the Missouri River is, and it goes out and it comes out down there. The Standing Rock Reservation and where all these abandoned mines are right here, these travel down the Grand River and empty into the Missouri River right here. There are three villages along here. Uh, two of them don't drink the water anymore, but the, the last village right here where it empties into the Grand River, they still drink the water. There, there is a sign at, at one of the, the, the mines over here. There's only one mine that, that we have been able to get the Forest Service or anybody to, to talk about. And it's called the Ryan Pass Mine. <clears throat> there is only one sign among all of these. And in this area that I'm talking about, there are 3,424 uh, abandoned open pit uranium mines. This is what it says. The radiation levels in this area are elevated. No more than one day within a one year period should be spent in this area. No camping. One sign. And the forcers put it up there after we complain and complain and complain because you can drive right into those open pit mines. This is one of them. <clears throat> this is a Roddy Pass mine. I've driven in there. Um, <clears throat> this area where the Riley Pass mine is was at once, one time, a very sacred place to not only the people of the Great Sea Nation, but many others as well. And what this is, is the overburden. This is the waste. All of this, all of this. And look how it's very fragile soil, and so the water is so easily eroded. Some of the, um, the, uh, the erosion ditches are from 8 to 10 feet deep. Here it is again. This is behind this, this area right here. Behind that is the Riley Pass Mine. And this one is located in the um, northwest corner of South Dakota. Right here, this whole area, this whole thing at one time was a sacred place to many nations besides the Great Sioux Nation people. The, how I got involved in this whole uranium uh, business was when a DEIS came out from the Forest Service because they wanted to build some more oil wells near this place. But in order to build those oil wells, they needed to build some more catch ponds. I didn't know what a catch pond was then. And we got this invitation, I got the invitation for defenders from the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer at Standing Rock Reservation because there was a burial site right there. It's a burial site right there. And they wanted to build a catch pond near there. And the archaeologist with the Forest Service was trying to help all of us. And so I went there and I got a copy of the DEIS and that's when I first heard about these abandoned uranium mines. And it was the archaeologist who was explaining to us that this was the overburden and it's all very radioactive. There's the overburden. Now this is how high it should have been. And so you can see how much was pushed off so that they could get to the uranium. Here's our sacred site. Here's our burial site. When I went there to look at this burial site, we were walking around out there, and this is when I came across this, and I, and I told the THPO and other people, I said, there is a sacred site there. And as we looked, there was another one right here beside it. And so we used to go up there every April and we would have a prayer ceremony up there but we would tell the young people not to come because the radiation levels are so high. Coming not only off of the wind coming over here but also from all this overburden right here. These are cows. The area is uh, managed by the Forest Service and so they can lease this public land. And so cows, this, that, that's a sacred site that I was showing you in that other picture. Just right off to the west part, south of it, is where these cows are, are at um, grazing.
because the cattle ranchers there raise their animals in there. Uh, they drink the water. I don't know if they have a picture of that. No problem. They drink the water that's in those catch ponds, the cattle do, and the ranchers feed them copper sulfate to make sure that they have this color in their, in their fur, and then they can sell the beef. Uh, otherwise, they would have a grayish color. This area where Hardy County, where all of this is located, has about 1,200 people. 25 of those people, the last I heard last spring, are diagnosed with brain tumors. 25 out of 1,200. That ratio is very, very high. And the only kind of brain tumors they get are those kinds of, from breathing in uranium. At this same area is a little elementary school. Now, I work with uh, two professors. One is a nuclear health physics professor from the University of Michigan, Dr. Kirfa. And the other one is Dr. Hannah McGarry, who is the head of the science and math department for Oglala Lakota College, which is on our reservation. He has his PhD in geology, and she has her PhD in nuclear physics. Um, <clears throat> she came a few years ago with uh, some students. I was finally able to get a film company to come up and start looking at this, because what I'm telling you is kind of, it affects everybody, not just us. And that was partly why we won the Nuclear Free Future Award. People from Germany have come out to try to find out what's going on. People from Japan, but not from the United States. It keeps getting, the secrecy of it keeps getting blocked. She brought some students on a cultural exchange tour because she understands that we are from a, another nation, a third world nation right in the middle of the United States. And she also has been helping me with this for a number of years. When she brought her students, we were trying to get into the Rye Pass mine, but that day it was uh, rainy and we couldn't get in there. You can drive in there, like I told you before, and we couldn't drive in there because it's just a, a dirt road, you know. And it gets washed out every now and then by the catch ponds when they overflow. So it, it was uh, the road we couldn't get in. We came back and I told her, I said, right behind the school, right behind the school is um, a private abandoned open pit uranium mine. It's huge. And so she was going to take her students in there. But I told them, I warned them, I said, if you want to have children, you young people, don't go in there. The radiation levels are very high. But it was like, I'd already showed her the, the one study that was done on the Rodney Pass mine, and that said 1,400 micrograms per hour. And she couldn't believe it. She thought that, that there had been an error or something. and so. She let her students go up there with Dr. Laguerre, and they climbed. They climbed. Up. They climbed over this this edge of that mine, and they were taking readings as they were going down. They got to the bottom, not all the way to the bottom, when they hit 1170 micrograms per hour. 1170 micrograms per hour is four times as much as is coming out of Fukushima. Four times as much. This mine is only a quarter of a mile away from this elementary school. And this is in northwestern South Dakota. It's at a blink of an eye little place called Ludlow. You can look on the maps and you'll see Ludlow. And it's just north of Buffalo, South Dakota. In the 150 years we've been in business, many things have changed. Our greatest achievements are rooted in the things that haven't. Years ago, the person you called banker was also the person you called friend. When it came to service, there were fewer layers and friendlier smiles. And banks earned the trust of their customers and community while working tirelessly not to lose it. At Independent Bank, all this remains true today. Sure, we've made advances that help customers bank more conveniently and more comfortably. But at the end of the day, we know that people really need a trustworthy partner committed to their financial goals, dreams, and aspirations. And we've been happy to be that partner since 1864. Stars here at Castle Dance and Gymnastics. From 16 months to adults, Castle offers a safe and friendly atmosphere. 
located at 11 Devon Drive. Their number is 231-798-8418. Or find them at castlegymdance.com. Hello, Ms. Keegan. My name is Mark Dubin. I'm the owner here at RPM Automotive. Uh, we've been here since 1996. We're a full-service auto repair center. We do both foreign and domestic repairs. Uh, most of our repairs are performed same day. We do everything from AC, engine repair, and computer diagnostics. Feel free to call or come by and see us. We're located on Getty Street, next to the Getty Street Grill. We in the northern Great Plains have the highest rates of cancer in the country. 
These are just for the Indians because there's no studies done on the white people in our region. North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming. This is in the middle of the United States. This is not in, in Europe. This is not in Asia. This is right here in the middle of the United States. Um, one minute. There's, there's yours truly. Um, this is how I usually look, like a school teacher. But in order to get my point across, because I could also pass for a Mexican or Iranian or somebody else, I want to make sure people know what is happening. Um, we have, uh, there was a group in uh, Colorado who was trying to stop Iranian mining, and they asked me, what can we do? And I said, give us a poster. And so they, they, made, they paid for this poster, no uranium mine in Great Nation territory. Um, what, what will happen, or what is happening? We have the highest cancer rates, highest heart rate, heart uh, disease, diabetes, highest in the country. And if they would do studies, probably the highest um, miscarriage rates. Women have miscarriages. They don't have children that are born deformed. I'm the miner's canary coming here. You know what happens to the miner's canary? When the miner's canary goes down into those mines with the miners, it breathes in the, the poison and it dies. My people are dying from the radiation pollution from 3,242 abandoned open pit uranium mines and not just from that. I have only come here today to talk about the abandoned mines and the waste and what is happening to us. There's more waste than that that is happening to us. My action plan is a bill, and it's in your packet. If we are able to stop the mining of uranium at the beginning of the nuclear cycle, then we won't be able to have nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons. In your packet is a draft bill, a Uranium Exploration and Mining Accountability Act. We want the United States to clean up all these abandoned uranium mines. I've only talked about the ones that are in the middle of the United States, in the Northern Great Plains. There's 1,300 of them in the Southwest. Where, where this young man comes from. There's probably more than that that we don't know because of the secrecy. But we need help. I asked the CDC to come out and do a study, and they said they wouldn't come because we have less than a million people in South Dakota. We asked the World Health Organization to come out and do a study. They never have, but then I found out that IAEA controls all the information that goes out from them, so it wouldn't matter anyway. But if this radioactive pollution is allowed to continue in the northern Great Plains region, and if new mining is allowed to continue, which, it, which all these states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming, are pro-uranium mining states, I can't go to the senators, I can't go to the Congress people from those states and tell them the story. They know it, especially the ones from South Dakota. They said, but what about the tourists? If the tourists find out all this radiation is here, they won't want to come. It's a beautiful area. 25 miles from Mount Rushmore are 142 abandoned uranium mines and prospects. They, our water has uranium in it. We have way more waste than just this mining that we are affected with radiation. But if we thought, if, if we could get this one bill passed, that would help. Because how are they going to clean up 3,242 abandoned uranium mines and put a moratorium on any more new mining until these mines are cleaned up? That's what this bill asks for. Put a moratorium on any more new mining until these mines are cleaned up. Because they're hurting the people, all the people. When that wind picks up that dust, it comes here to Chicago. It comes all across the United States. That water. The Missouri River is contaminated from those abandoned mines. I've done the studies, I've done the water tests, we already know. It's flying into the Mississippi. The groundwater, yes, that's all contaminated too. 
There is also on that table, that second table over there, there is another piece over there. It's called America's Secret Chernobyl. That's what we call our region, America's Secret Chernobyl. I just looked up before I came at the Chernobyl Hotel. Their, their um, levels are 13 micro-rems per hour. I have just done random studies of our normal background where I am in South Dakota. Our normal background goes from 13 to 15 micro-rems per hour. And that's why we call our region America's Secret Chernobyl. If you want to find out all the other ways that we are affected, pick up one of those yellow sheets back there because it's more than just the mining. I want to thank you all so much. My contact information is on that yellow sheet back there. And I want to thank you all so much for all this work that you do. If we're not able to stop these mines, it means certain genocide for my nation. Thank you. together is like herding cats. Simplifying things for families is a priority here at Grange Insurance. We offer a variety of policies through Grange Independent Agent. Your partner in protection. We all want to age gracefully and maintain our independence and dignity for as long as we live. Yet, we all fear becoming disabled, dependent, and at risk of having to live in a nursing home. Navigating the world of senior services can be overwhelming to anyone of any age. Senior Resources is your local area agency on aging. Our mission is to serve as your compass to locate needed services such as senior housing, home health care, respite care, and ongoing care management needs. If you are seeking advice on services that will help you or a loved one continue living at home, call the elder care experts at Senior Resources, 739-5858. Senior Resources, we're with you every step of the way. Located in Tanglewood Park, 560 Seminole Road, Muskegon. Culver's Concrete Mixers, the creamiest way to eat a Reese's peanut butter cup. We put as much care into our fresh frozen custard as Reese's puts into its peanut butter cups. Not only do we use family farm fresh dairy, we also use the best vanilla and cocoa beans. Handcrafting each concrete mixer, it creates a perfect blend. Which brings us back to this, the creamiest way to eat a Reese's. Put the spoon in straight and tall, you've got a perfect concrete mixer. Welcome to Delicious. Benson's Drug Company, the home of Benson's Bottom Paint. Offering an expanded grocery selection, Medicare billing, and diabetes management and education. Benson's now features a Kodak machine, which allows customers to edit, copy, and develop their own photos. McDonald's Candies, 1064 South Getty Street in Muskegon, features an assortment of chocolate-covered nuts and creams, peanut clusters, fudge, seafoam, turtles, cherry cordials, and regular and holiday novelties. Hello, my name is Brett Wright. I own and operate Phoenix Crematory Services. Phoenix Crematory Services is located in Muskegon, Michigan, and we work with area funeral homes offering cremation services. We also are able to work directly with your family and their cremation needs. If you would like more information on the services that we have to offer, please contact us 231-733-5200 or go on our website, www.muskegoncremation.com. Thank you.